Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neo-Fusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of neo-fusionism. Neo-fusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So for this episode, we will be looking at a critical book for neo-fusionist theory, uh, and that is Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. Human nature is very important to me. The study of human nature is going to be an important part of this podcast, and this book uh, really just kind of establishes... Um, that there is such a thing as human nature. We don't completely understand it, but we're in the process of exploring it. And uh, he, he puts forward some ideas about what we know about it. Um, you know, it's a good-sized book for over 400 pages, well over 400 pages, um, and packed with information. Some of the later sections of the book I'm not going to cover uh, in as much detail because these are topics such as politics and violence and gender and uh, children. And those are um, things that I think are all going to ultimately get uh, a, an individual podcast devoted to. So with this book, I'm more concerned about the earlier sections when he, t when he provides a kind of a background of the history of the study of human nature in the universities. Um, I don't want to get into, he goes into the science of it a little bit. I don't want to get into that either. I really just want to kind of talk about the reaction that he faces, um, or that, and I shouldn't say that he faces, but that, um, evolutionary psychologists have faced in the study of human nature. Um, so he has a few, let's see. This book was originally published in 2002, so it's already, you know, over 15 years old. But, you know, you, you, you read it and you recognize that a lot of the same things are going on today. He's got a few concepts that he structures his book around. Um, these are the blank slate, obviously, the namesake, um, which is the idea that there's no particular human nature. And he also talks about two other ideas, the noble savage and the ghost in the machine, as being kind of the three delusions, the three mistakes that uh, modern society makes and the society has historically made about human nature and why they aren't true. And so I'm going to jump in here and read to you a little bit as usual so we can get his perspective on this. He says, quote, During the past century, the doctrine of the blank slate has set the agenda for much of the social sciences and humanities. As we shall see, psychology has sought to explain all thought, feeling, and behavior with a few simple mechanisms of learning. The social sciences has sought to explain all customs and social arrangements as a product of the socialization of children by the surrounding culture a system of words, images, stereotypes, role models, and contingencies of reward and punishment. A long and growing list of concepts that would seem natural to the human way of thinking, emotions, kinship, the sexes, illness, nature, the world, are now said to have been invented or socially constructed. The blank slate has also served as a sacred scripture for political and ethical beliefs. According to the doctrine, any differences we see among races, ethnic groups, sexes, and individuals come not from differences in their innate constitution, but from differences in their experiences. Change the experiences by reforming parenting, education, the media, and social rewards, and you can change the person. Underachievement, poverty, and antisocial behavior can be ameliorated. Indeed, it is irresponsible not to do so. And discrimination on the basis of purportedly inborn traits of a sex or ethnic group is simply irrational. End quote. So that's the basic uh, description of the blank slate. And then uh, he also talks about the noble savage and the ghost in the machine. 
uh, the noble savage being uh, the idea that we're basically born with good intentions and civilization uh, basically leads us away from our innate purity and our innate nobility and goodness. Um, and then the ghost in the machine is the idea that uh, d despite a mechanical nature of our bodies, uh, there's a certain sense, there's a certain thing inside you, a divine spark, you could consider it, or a soul, or a certain uh, ghost, a thing that is not bound by the laws of the machine uh, of the body. That's the ghost in the machine. And he talks about those as well. He says, quote, It can indeed be upsetting to think of ourselves as glorified gears and springs. Machines are insensate, built to be used and disposable. Humans are sentient, possessing of dignity and rights, and infinitely precious. A machine has some workaday purpose, such as grinding grain or sharpening pencils. A human being has higher purposes such as love, worship, good works, and the creation of knowledge and beauty. The behavior of machines is determined by the ineluctable laws of physics and chemistry. The behavior of people is freely chosen. With choice comes freedom, and therefore optimism about our possibilities for the future. With choice also comes responsibility, which allows us to hold people accountable for their actions. And of course, if the mind is separate from the body, it can continue to exist when the body breaks down, and our thoughts and pleasures will not someday be snuffed out forever. As I mentioned, most Americans continue to believe in an immortal soul made of some non-physical substance, which can part company with the body, but even those who do not avow that belief in so many words still imagine that somehow there must be more to us than electrical and chemical energy in the brain. Choice, dignity, and responsibility are gifts that set off human beings from everything else in the universe and seem incompatible with the idea that we are mere collections of molecules. Attempts to explain behavior in mechanistic terms are commonly denounced as reductionist or determinist. The denouncers rarely know exactly what they mean by those words, but everyone knows they refer to something bad. The dichotomy between mind and body also pervades everyday speech as when we say, use your head when we refer to out-of-body experiences, and when we speak of John's body, or for that matter, John's brain, which presupposes an owner, John, that is somehow separate from the brain it owns. Journalists sometimes speculate about brain transplants when they really should be calling them body transplants because, as the philosopher Dan Dennett has noted, this is the one transplant operation in which it is better to be the donor than the recipient. The doctrines of the blank slate, the noble savage, and the ghost in the machine, or as philosophers call them, empiricism, romanticism, and dualism, are logically independent, but in practice they are often found together. If the slate is blank, then strictly speaking it has neither injunctions to do good nor injunctions to do evil, but good and evil are asymmetrical. There are more ways to harm people than to help them, and harmful acts can hurt them, to a greater degree than virtuous acts can make them better off. So a blank slate, compared with one filled with motives, is bound to impress us more by its inability to do harm than its inability to do good. Rousseau did not literally believe in a blank slate, but he did believe that bad behavior is a product of learning and socialization. Men are wicked, he wrote. A sad and constant experience makes proof unnecessary. But this wickedness comes from society. Quote, men are wicked, he wrote. A sad and constant experience makes proof unnecessary. End quote. But the wickedness comes from society. Quote, there is no original perversity in the human heart. There is not a single vice to be found in it, of which it cannot be said how and whence it entered. End quote. If the metaphors in everyday speech are a clue, then all of us, like Rousseau, associate blankness with virtue rather than with nothingness. Think of the moral connotations of the adjectives clean, fair, immaculate, lily-white, pure, spotless, unmarred, and unsullied, and of the nouns blemish, blot, mark, stain, and taint. The blank slate naturally coexists with the ghost in the machine, too, since a slate that is blank is a hospitable place for a ghost to haunt. If a ghost is to be at the controls, the factory can ship the device with a minimum of parts. The ghost can read the body's display panels and pull its levers with no need for a high-tech executive program, guidance system, or CPU. The more not clockwork there is controlling behavior, the less clockwork we need to posit. 
For similar reasons, the ghost in the machine happily accompanies the noble savage. If the machine behaves ignobly, we can blame the ghost, which freely chose to carry out the iniquitous acts. We need not probe for a defect in the machine's design. So as you can see, he's laying out a philosophy uh, that he tracks back to Rousseau and he tracks back to also uh, Rene Descartes for the ghost in the machine theory. Um, although I think ghost in the machine as a, as a real uh, metaphysical view of a body and sold goes back further than Descartes. But uh, these are the three ideas that he is he is uh, dissecting. So I'm going to jump to the next section where he talks about the response that uh, scientific exploration of human nature uh, that is presenting evidence that is contrary to the blank slate theory um, ha has received such a negative response from the press and from the left. Um, and this part, this part sounds really familiar. He's writing this book, as I said, uh, you know, over 15 years ago, but he's talking about things that happened well before that. And the response is the same response that a lot of this stuff receives today. He says, quote, Throughout history, battles of opinion have been waged by noisy moralizing, demonizing, hyperbole, and worse. Science was supposed to be a beachhead in which ideas rather than people are attacked, and in which verifiable facts are separated from political opinions. But when science began to edge toward the topic of human nature, onlookers reacted differently from how they would to discoveries about, say, the origin of comets or the classification of lizards, and scientists reverted to the moralistic mindset that comes so naturally to our species. Research on human nature would be controversial in any era, but the new sciences picked a particularly bad decade in which to attract the spotlight. In the 1970s, many intellectuals had become political radicals. Marxism was correct, liberalism was for wimps, and Marx had pronounced that the ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. The traditional misgivings about human nature were folded into a hard left ideology, and scientists who examined the human mind in a biological context were now considered tools of a reactionary establishment. The critics announced they were part of a radical science movement, giving us a convenient label for the group. He says, quote, In 1971, the psychologist Richard Herrnstein published an article called IQ in the Atlantic Monthly. Herrnstein's argument, he was the first to point out, should have been banal. He wrote that as social status becomes less strongly determined by arbitrary legacies, such as race, parentage, and inherited wealth, it will become more strongly determined by talent, especially in a modern economy, intelligence. Since differences in intelligence are partly inherited, and since intelligent people tend to marry other intelligent people, when a society becomes more just, it will also become more stratified along genetic lines. Smarter people will tend to float into the higher strata, and their children will tend to stay there. The basic argument should be banal because it is based on a mathematical necessity, as the proportion of variance in social status caused by non-genetic factors goes down, the proportion caused by genetic factors has to go up. It could be completely false only if there were no variation in social status based on intellectual talent, which would require that people not preferentially hire and trade with the talented or if there were no genetic variation in intelligence, which would require people to be either blank slates or clones. Hernstein's argument does not imply that any differences in average intelligence between races are innate, a distinct hypothesis that had been broached by the psychologist Arthur Jensen two years earlier, and he explicitly denied that he was making such a claim. School desegregation was less than a generation old, civil rights legislation less than a decade, so the differences that have been documented in average IQ scores of blacks and whites could easily be explained by differences in opportunity. Indeed, to say that Herrnstein's syllogism implied that black people would end up at the bottom of a genetically stratified society was to add the gratuitous assumption that blacks were on average genetically less intelligent, which Herrnstein took pains to avoid. 
Nonetheless, the influential psychiatrist Alvin Puissant wrote that Hernstein has become the enemy of black people and his pronouncements are a threat to the survival of every black person in America. He asked rhetorically, Shall we carry banners for Hernstein, proclaiming his right to freedom of speech? Leaflets were handed out at Boston-area universities, urging students to fight Harvard professors', professors fascist lies, and Harvard Square was plastered with his photograph above the caption, Wanted for Racism, and five misquotations purportedly from his article. Hernstein received a death threat and found that he could no longer speak about his research specialty, learning in pigeons, because wherever he went, the lecture halls were filled with chanting mobs. At Princeton, for example, students declared they would block the doors of the auditorium to force him to answer questions on the IQ controversy. Several lectures were canceled when the hosting universities said they could not guarantee his safety. The topic of innate differences among people has obvious political implications, which I will examine in later chapters, but some scholars were incensed by the seemingly warm and fuzzy claim that people have innate commonalities. In the late 1960s, the psychologist Paul Ekman discovered that smiles, frowns, sneers, grimaces, and other facial expressions were displayed and understood worldwide, even among foraging peoples with no prior contact with the West. These findings, he argued, vindicated two claims that Darwin had made in his 1872 book, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. One was that humans had been endowed with emotional expressions by the process of evolution. The other, radical in Darwin's time, was that all races had recently diverged from a common ancestor. Despite these uplifting messages, Margaret Mead called Ekman's research outrageous, appalling, and a disgrace, and these were some of the milder responses. At the annual meeting of the American Anthropological Association, Alan Lomax Jr. rose from the audience shouting that Ekman should not be allowed to speak because his ideas were fascist. On another occasion, an African-American activist accused him of racism for claiming that black facial expressions were no different from white ones. Sometimes you can't win. And it was not just claims about innate faculties in the human species that drew the radicals' ire, but claims about innate faculties in any species. When the neuroscientist Torsen Weisel published his historic work with David Hubel, showing that the visual system of cats is largely complete at birth, another neuroscientist angrily called him a fascist and vowed to prove him wrong. Some of these protests were signs of the times and faded with the decline of radical chic. But the reaction to two books on evolution continued for decades and became part of the intellectual mainstream. The first was E.O. Wilson's Sociobiology, published in 1975. Sociobiology synthesized a vast literature on animal behavior using new ideas on natural selection from George Williams, William Hamilton, John Maynard Smith, and Robert Trivers. It reviewed principles on the evolution of communication, altruism, aggression, sex, and parenting, and applied them to the major taxa of social animals, such as insects, fishes, and birds. The 27th chapter did the same for Homo sapiens, treating our species like another branch of the animal kingdom. It included a review of the literature on universals and variation among societies, a discussion of language and its effects on culture, and the hypothesis that some universals, including the moral sense, may come from a human nature shaped by natural selection. Wilson expressed the hope that this idea might connect biology to the social sciences and philosophy, a forerunner of the argument in his later book, Consilience. He says, quote, at Harvard, there were leaflets and teachings, a protester with a bullhorn calling for Wilson's dismissal and invasions of his classroom by slogan shouting students. When he spoke at other universities, posters called him the right wing prophet of patriarchy and urged people to bring noisemakers to his lectures. Wilson was about to speak at a 1978 meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science when a group of people carrying play cards, one with a swastika, rushed onto the stage chanting, Racist Wilson, you can't hide, we charge you with genocide. One protester grabbed the microphone and harangued the audience while another doused Wilson with a pitcher of water. End quote. He goes on to say, later in this chapter, he says, quote, 
no one should be surprised that claims about human nature are controversial. Obviously, any such claim should be scrutinized and any logical and empirical flaws pointed out, just as with any scientific hypothesis. But the criticism of the new sciences of human nature went well beyond ordinary scholarly debate. It turned into harassment, slurs, misrepresentation, doctored quotations, and most recently, blood libel. I think there are two reasons for this illiberal behavior. One is that in the 20th century, the blank slate became a sacred doctrine that in the minds of its defenders had to be either avowed with a perfect faith or renounced in every aspect. Only such black and white thinking could lead people to convert the idea that some aspects of human behavior are innate into the idea that all aspects of behavior are innate or convert the proposal that genetic traits influence human affairs into the idea that they determine human affairs. Only if it is theologically necessary for 100% of the differences in intelligence to be caused by the environment could anyone be incensed over the mathematical banality that as the proportion of variance due to non-genetic causes goes down, the proportion due to genetic causes must go up. Only if the mind is required to be a scraped tablet could anyone be outraged by the claim that human nature makes us smile rather than scowl when we are pleased. A second reason is that radical thinkers got trapped by their own moralizing. Once they staked themselves to the lazy argument that racism, sexism, war, and political inequality were factually incorrect because there is no such thing as human nature, as opposed to being morally despicable, regardless of the details of human nature, every discovery about human nature was by their own reasoning tantamount to saying that those scourges were not so bad after all. That made it all the more pressing to discredit the heretics making the discoveries. If ordinary standards of scientific argumentation were not doing the trick, other tactics had to be brought in because a greater good was at stake, end quote. So you can see the reaction that uh, E.O. Wilson experienced and other authors experienced. He also brings up Richard Dawkins and the 1976 book The Selfish Gene. Uh, that one I, is supposed to be really good. I haven't read it, but I definitely want to put it in my put it in my list. Anyway, he goes on to talk about how the opposition to a study of human nature has roots in uh, Nazi ideology and the rejection thereof. Uh, basically, the claim that the Nazis built their uh, genocidal system on notions of genetic purity and therefore genetic influences of human behavior and, a, and a, just a general study of human genetics um, frightens people who feel tied to the blank slate theory uh, morally, morally tied to the blank slate theory. He says, quote, the most sickening associations of a biological conception of human nature are the ones to Nazism. Though the opposition to the idea of a human nature began decades earlier, historians agree that bitter memories of the Holocaust were the main reason that human nature became taboo in intellectual life after World War II. Hitler was undeniably influenced by the bastardized version of Darwinism and genetics that were popular in the early decades of the 20th century, and he specifically cited natural selection and the survival of the fittest in laying out his poisonous doctrine. He believed in an extreme social Darwinism, in which groups were the unit of selection and a struggle among groups was necessary for national strength and vigor. He believed that the groups were constitutionally distinct races, that their members shared a distinctive biological makeup, and that they differed from one another in strength, courage, honesty, intelligence, and civic mindedness. He wrote that the extinction of inferior races was part of the wisdom of nature that the superior races owed their vitality and virtue to their genetic purity, and that the superior, superior races were in danger of being degraded by interbreeding with the inferior ones. He used these beliefs to justify his war of conquest and his genocide of Jews, gypsies, Slavs, and homosexuals. The misuse of biology by the Nazis is a reminder that perverted ideas can have horrifying consequences, and that intellectuals have a responsibility 
to take responsible care that their ideas not be misused for evil ends. But part of that responsibility is not to trivialize the horror of Nazism by exploiting it for rhetorical clout in academic catfights. Linking the people you disagree with to Nazism does nothing for the memory of Hitler's victims or for the effort to prevent other genocides. It is precisely because these events are so grave that we have a special responsibility to identify their causes precisely. He says, quote, Hitler was evil because he caused the deaths of 30 million people and inconceivable suffering to countless others, not because his beliefs made reference to biology or linguistics or nature or smoking or God, smearing the guilt from his actions to every conceivable aspect of his factual beliefs can only backfire. Ideas are connected to other ideas, and should any of Hitler's turn out to have some grain of truth if races, for example, turn out to have any biological reality, or if the Indo-Europeans really were a conquering tribe, we would not want to concede that Nazism wasn't so wrong after all. The Nazi Holocaust was a singular event that changed attitudes toward countless political and scientific topics, but it was not the only ideologically inspired Holocaust in the 20th century, and intellectuals are only beginning to assimilate the lessons of the others. The mass killings in the Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, and other totalitarian states carried out in the name of Marxism. The opening of Soviet archives and the release of data and memoirs on the Chinese and Cambodian revolutions are forcing a reevaluation of the consequences of ideology as wrenching as that following World War II. Historians are currently debating whether the communists' mass executions, forced marches, slave labor, and man-made famines led to 100 million deaths or only 25 million. They are debating whether these atrocities are morally worse than the Nazi Holocaust or only the equivalent. And here is the remarkable fact. Though both Nazi and Marxist ideologies led to industrial-scale killing, their biological and psychological theories were opposites. Marxists had no use for the concept of race, were averse to the notion of genetic inheritance, and were hostile to the very idea of a human nature rooted in biology. Marx and Engels did not explicitly express the doctrine of the blank slate in their writings, but they were adamant that human nature has no enduring properties. It consists only in the interactions of groups of people with their material environments in a historical period, and constantly changes as people change their environment and are simultaneously changed by it. The mind, therefore, has no innate structure, but emerges from the dialectical processes of history, and social interaction. He says, quote, The new realization that government-sponsored mass murder can come from an anti-innatist belief system as easily as from an innatist one upends the post-war understanding that biological approaches to behavior are uniquely sinister. An accurate appraisal of the cause of state genocides must look for beliefs common to Nazism and Marxism that launched them on their parallel trajectories and for the beliefs specific to Marxism that led to the unique atrocities committed in its name. A new wave of historians and philosophers is doing exactly that. Nazism and Marxism shared a desire to reshape humanity. The alteration of men on a mass scale is necessary, wrote Marx. The will to create mankind anew is the core of National Socialism, wrote Hitler. They also shared a revolutionary idealism, and a tyrannical certainty in pursuit of this dream, with no patience for incremental reform or adjustments guided by the human consequences of their policies. This alone was a recipe for disaster. The ideological connection between Marxist socialism and national socialism is not fanciful. Hitler read Marx carefully while living in Munich in 1913, and may have picked up from him a fateful postulate that the two ideologies would share. It is the belief that history is a preordained succession of conflicts between groups of people and that improvement in the human condition can only come from the victory of one group over the others. For the Nazis, the groups were races. For the Marxists, they were classes. For the Nazis, the conflict was social Darwinism, and for the Marxists, it was class struggle. For the Nazis, the destined victors were the Aryans. For the Marxists, they were the proletariat. The ideologies, once implemented, led to atrocities in a few steps. Struggle, often a euphemism for violence, is inevitable and beneficial. 
Certain groups of people, the non-Aryan races, or the bourgeoisie, are morally inferior. Improvements in human welfare depend on their subjugation or elimination. Aside from supplying a direct justification for violent conflict, the ideology of intergroup struggle ignites a nasty feature of human social psychology, the tendency to divide people into in-groups and out-groups, and to treat the out-groups as less than human. It doesn't matter whether the groups are thought to be defined by their biology or by their history. Psychologists have found that they can create instant intergroup hostility by sorting people on just about any pretext, including the flip of a coin. He says, quote, None of this is meant to impugn the blank slate as an evil doctrine, any more than a belief in human nature is an evil doctrine. Both are separated by a great many steps from the wicked acts committed under their banners, and they must be evaluated on factual grounds. But it is meant to overturn the simplistic linkage of the sciences of human nature with the moral catastrophes of the 20th century. That glib association stands in the way of our desire to understand ourselves, and it stands in the way of the imperative to understand the causes of those catastrophes. All the more so if the causes have something to do with a side of ourselves that we do not fully understand. End quote. So that's a really nice section. He, he kind of like tackles that head on um, and just kind of proves how ridiculous it is to casually throw around these accusations of Nazi and fascist. So he talks a little bit later on um, about postmodernism and relativism. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of this. I'm not going to read a tremendous amount, but uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, approach to how we think about the world and how we think about reality. And he says, quote, The human brain equips us to thrive in a world of objects, living things, and other people. Those entities have a large impact on our well-being, and one would expect the brain to be well-suited to detecting them and their powers. Failing to recognize a steep precipice or a hungry panther or a jealous spouse can have significant negative consequences for biological fitness, to put it mildly. The fantastic complexity of the brain is there in part to register consequential facts about the world around us. But this truism has been rejected by many sectors of modern intellectual life. According to the relativistic wisdom prevailing in much of academia today, reality is socially constructed by the use of language, stereotypes, and media images. The idea that people have access to facts about the world is naive, say the proponents of social constructionism, social studies, cultural studies, critical theory, postmodernism, and deconstructionism. In their view, observations are always infected by theories, and theories are saturated with ideology and political doctrines. So anyone who claims to have the facts or know the truth is just trying to exert power over everyone else. Relativism is entwined with the doctrine of the blank slate in two ways. One is that relativists have a penny-pinching theory of psychology, in which the mind has no mechanisms designed to grasp reality. All it can do is passively download words, images, and stereotypes from the surrounding culture. The other is the relativist's attitude towards science. Most scientists regard their work as an extension of our everyday ability to figure out what is out there and how things work. Telescopes and microscopes amplify the visual system. Theories formalize our hunches about cause and effect. Experiments refine our drive to gather evidence about events we cannot witness directly. Relativist movements agree that science is perception and cognition writ large, but they draw the opposite conclusion that scientists, like lay people, are unequipped to grasp an objective reality. Instead, their advocates say, Western science is only one way of describing reality, nature, and the way things work. A very effective way, certainly, for the production of goods and profits, but unsatisfactory in most other respects. It is an imperialist arrogance which ignores the sciences and insights of most other cultures and times. Nowhere is this more significant than in the scientific study of politically charged topics such as race, gender, violence, and social organization. Appealing to facts, or the truth, in connection with these topics is just a ruse, the relativists say, because there is no truth in the sense of an objective yardstick independent of cultural and political presuppositions. Skepticism 
about the soundness of people's mental faculties also determines whether one should respect ordinary people's tastes and opinions, even those we don't like very much, or treat the people as dupes of an insidious commercial culture. According to relativist doctrines like false consciousness, inauthentic preferences, and interiorized authority, people may be mistaken about their own desires. If so, it would undermine the assumptions behind democracy, which gives ultimate authority to the preferences of a majority of a population, and the assumptions behind market economies, which treat people as the best judges of how they should allocate their own resources. Perhaps not coincidentally, it elevates the scholars and artists who analyze the use of language and images in society, because only they can unmask the ways in which the media mislead and corrupt. End quote. And then shortly later, he goes on in this vein. He says, quote, The word stereotype originally referred to a kind of printing plate. Its current sense as a pejorative and inaccurate image standing for a category of people was introduced in 1922 by the journalist Walter Lippmann. Lippmann was an important public intellectual who, among other things, helped to found the New Republic, influenced Woodrow Wilson's policies at the end of World War I, and wrote some of the first attacks on IQ testing. In his book Public Opinion, Lippmann fretted about the difficulty of achieving true democracy in an age in which ordinary people could no longer judge public issues rationally because they got their information in what we today would call sound bites. As part of this argument, Lippmann proposed that ordinary people's concepts of social groups were stereotypes, mental pictures that are incomplete, biased, insensitive to variation, and resistant to disconfirming information. Lippmann had an immediate influence on social science, though the subtleties and qualifications of his original argument were forgotten. Psychologists gave people lists of ethnic groups and lists of traits and asked them to pair them up. Sure enough, people linked Jews with shrewd and mercenary, Germans with efficient and nationalistic, Negroes with superstitious and happy-go-lucky, and so on. Such generalizations are pernicious when applied to individuals, and though they are still lamentably common in much of the world, they are now actively avoided by educated people and by mainstream public figures. By the 1970s, many thinkers were not content to note that stereotypes about categories of people can be inaccurate. They began to insist that the categories themselves don't exist other than in our stereotypes. An effective way to fight racism, sexism, and other kinds of prejudice in this view is to deny that conceptual categories about people have any claim to objective reality. It would be impossible to believe that homosexuals are effeminate, black superstitious, and women passive if there were no such things as categories of homosexuals, blacks, or women to begin with. For example, the philosopher Richard Rorty has written, The homosexual, the negro, and the female are best seen not as inevitable classifications of human beings, but rather as inventions that have done more harm than good. For that matter, many writers think, why stop there? Better still to insist that all categories are social constructions and therefore figments because that would really make invidious stereotypes figments. Rorty notes with approval that many thinkers today go on to suggest that quarks and genes are probably inventions too. Postmodernists and other relativists attack truth and objectivity not so much because they are interested in philosophical problems of ontology and epistemology but because they feel it is the best way to pull the rug out from under racists, sexists, and homophobes. The philosopher Ian Hacking provides a list of almost 40 categories that have recently been claimed to be socially constructed. The prime examples are race, gender, masculinity, nature, facts, reality, and the past. But the list has been growing and now includes authorship, AIDS, brotherhood, choice, danger, dementia, illness, Indian forests, inequality, the Landsat satellite system, the medicalized immigrant, the nation-state, quarks, school success, serial homicide, technological systems, white-collar crime, women, refugees, and Zulu nationalism. According to Hacking, the common thread is a conviction that the category is not determined by the nature of things and therefore is not inevitable. 
The further implication is that we would be much better off if it were done away with or radically transformed. This whole enterprise is based on an unstated theory of human concept formation, that conceptual categories bear no systematic relation to things in the world, but are socially constructed and can therefore be reconstructed. Is it a correct theory? In some cases, it has a grain of truth. As we saw in Chapter 4, some categories really are social constructions. They exist only because people tacitly agree to act as if they exist. Examples include money, tenure, citizenship, decorations for bravery, and the presidency of the United States. But that does not mean that all conceptual categories are socially constructed. Concept formation has been studied for decades by cognitive psychologists, and they conclude that most concepts pick out categories of object in the world which had some kind of reality before we ever stopped to think about them. Yes, every snowflake is unique, and no category will do complete justice to every one of its members. But intelligence depends on lumping together things that share properties, so that we are not flabbergasted by every new thing we encounter. We perceive some traits of a new object, place it in a mental category, and infer that it is likely to have the other traits typical of that category, ones we cannot perceive. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. If it's a duck, it's likely to swim, fly, have a back off which water rolls, and contain meat that's tasty when wrapped in a pancake with scallions and hoisin sauce. End quote. So, yeah, I think that's important. How, how, we, how we perceive the categories of existing things, we perceive them in a way that is beneficial to our survival and our capacity to make our way in the world. Um, you know, we, we assume rightly that the things around us exist and that our methods of interpreting them and structuring our information is the correct way to do so. And the idea that we structure things one way, but we could structure them a different way if we, if we choose to just deconstruct the existing mental patterns and build new ones that discounts the idea that that we may have done the things that we've done them in a certain way for on purpose and it's not necessarily a good idea to disassemble it immediately because we don't necessarily know what the motivations were to create the structural systems that we operate with we have a, an inborn inclination to to adhere to the socially developed mental and cultural framework. It allows us to operate as a society. It's, it's hardwired into us to follow certain conceptual arrangements. And the arrangements benefit us because they've proven to benefit us for so long. And, you know, based on, on, laws of logic and game theory, basic biological realities of existence, that they become behavioral traits. And people who possess certain behavioral inclinations, which adhere to the correct cultural framework, are going to propagate their genetic code. And we thus gain genetic behavioral processes that allow us to specialize and succeed in the environment of planet Earth. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the core opposition to this ridiculous postmodern proposal. So moving along here to section five, uh, we get a chance to talk about altruism, which is often put forward as the reigning argument against uh, selfish, genetic, uh, evolutionary survival of the fittest inclination. The, the argument that people use genetic, uh, that if we, if we just adhere to a simply genetic approach to human nature, it becomes overridden with 
competitive selfishness, the, the social Darwinist kind of approach, right? I guess this is a, a rebuttal to social Darwinism. So I'll go ahead and read this section. He says, quote, Our bodies are extraordinarily improbable arrangements of matter, with many ways for things to go wrong and only a few ways for things to go right. We are certain to die and smart enough to know it. Our minds are adapted to a world that no longer exists, prone to misunderstanding, correctable only by arduous education, and condemned to perplexity about the deepest questions we can entertain. But some of the most painful shocks come from the social world, from the manipulations and betrayals of other people. According to the fable, a scorpion asked a frog to carry him across a river, reassuring the frog that he wouldn't sting him because if he did, he would drown too. Halfway across, the scorpion did sting him. And when the sinking frog asked why, the scorpion replied, it's in my nature. Technically speaking, a scorpion with this nature could not have evolved, but Trivers has explained why it sometimes seems as if human nature is like the fabled scorpion nature, condemned to apparently pointless conflict. It's no mystery why organisms sometimes harm one another. Evolution has no conscience, and if one creature hurts another to benefit itself, such as by eating, parasitizing, intimidating, or cuckolding it, its descendants will come to predominate, complete with those nasty habits. All this is familiar from the vernacular sense of Darwinian as a synonym for ruthless, and from Tennyson's depiction of nature as red in tooth and claw. If that were all there was to the evolution of the human condition, we would have to agree with the rock song, Life sucks, then you die. But, of course, life doesn't always suck. Many creatures cooperate, nurture, and make peace, and humans in particular find comfort and joy in their families, friends, and communities. This, too, should be familiar to readers of The Selfish Gene, and the other books on the evolution of altruism that have appeared in the years since. There are several reasons why organisms may evolve a willingness to do good deeds. They may help other creatures while pursuing their own interests, say, when they form a herd that confuses predators or live off each other's byproducts. This is called mutualism, symbiosis, or cooperation. Among humans, friends who have common tastes, hobbies, or enemies are a kind of symbiont pair. The two parents of a brood of children are an even better example. Their genes are tied up in the same package, their children, so what is good for one is good for the other, and each has an interest in keeping the other alive and healthy. These shared interests set the stage for companionate love and marital love to evolve. And in some cases, organisms may benefit other organisms at a cost to themselves, which biologists call altruism. Altruism in this technical sense, can evolve in two main ways. First, since relatives share genes, any gene that inclines an organism toward helping a relative will increase the chance of survival of a copy of itself that sits inside that relative, even if the helper sacrifices its own fitness in the generous act. Such genes will, on average, come to predominate as long as the cost to the helper is less than the benefit to the recipient discounted by their degree of relatedness. Family love, the cherishing of children, siblings, parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts, nieces and nephews, and cousins, can evolve. This is called nepotistic altruism. Altruism can also evolve when organisms trade favors. One helps another by grooming, feeding, protecting, or backing him, and is helped in turn when the needs reverse. This is called reciprocal altruism, and it can evolve when parties recognize each other, interact repeatedly, can confer a large benefit on others at small cost to themselves, keep a memory for favors offered or denied, and are impelled to reciprocate accordingly. Reciprocal altruism can evolve because cooperators do better than hermits or misanthropes. They enjoy the gains of trading their surpluses, pulling ticks out of one another's hair, saving each other from drowning or starvation, and babysitting each other's children. Reciprocators can also do better over the long run than the cheaters who take favors without returning them, because the reciprocators will come to recognize the cheaters and shun or punish them. The demands of reciprocal altruism 
can explain why the social and moralistic emotions evolved. Sympathy and trust prompt people to extend the first favor. Gratitude and loyalty prompt them to repay favors. Guilt and shame deter them from hurting or failing to repay others. Anger and contempt prompt them to avoid or punish cheaters. And among humans, any tendency of an individual to reciprocate or cheat does not have to be witnessed firsthand but can be recounted by language. This leads to an interest in the reputation of others, transmitted by gossip and public approval or condemnation, and a concern with one's own reputation. Partnerships, friendships, alliances, and communities can emerge, cemented by these emotions and concerns. He says, quote, The most obvious human tragedy comes from the difference between our feelings toward kin and our feelings toward non-kin, one of the deepest divides in the living world. When it comes to love and solidarity among people, the relative viscosity of blood and water is evident in everything from the clans and dynasties of traditional societies to the clogging of airports during holidays with people traveling across the world to be with their families. It has also been borne out by the quantitative studies. In traditional foraging societies, genetic relatives are more likely to live together, work in each other's gardens, protect each other, and adopt each other's needy or orphaned children, and are less likely to attack, feud with, and kill each other. Even in modern societies, which tend to sunder ties of kinship, the more closely two people are genetically related, the more inclined they are to come to one another's aid, especially in life-or-death situations. But love and solidarity are relative. To say that people are more caring toward their relatives is to say that they are more callous toward their non-relatives. Moral philosophers play with a hypothetical dilemma, in which people can run through the left door of a burning building to save some number of children, or through the right door to save their own child. If you are a parent, ponder this question. Is there any number of children that would lead you to pick the left door? Indeed, all of us reveal our preference with our pocketbooks when we spend money on trifles for our own children, a bicycle, orthodontics, an education at a private school or university. Instead of saving the lives of unrelated children in the developing world, by donating the money to charity. Similarly, the practice of parents bequeathing their wealth to their children is one of the steepest impediments to an economically egalitarian society, yet few people would allow the government to confiscate 100% of their estate because most people see their children as an extension of themselves and thus as the proper beneficiaries of their lifelong striving. He says, quote, Throughout history, when leaders have tried to unite a social group they have trained their members to think of it as a family and to redirect their familial emotions inside it. The names used by groups that strive for solidarity, brethren, brotherhoods, fraternal organizations, sisterhood, sororities, crime families, the family of man, concede in their metaphors that kinship is the paradigm to which they aspire. No society tries to strengthen the family by likening it to a trade union, political party, or church group. The tactic is provably effective. Several experiments have shown that people are more convinced by a political speech if the speaker appeals to their hearts and minds with kinship metaphors. Verbal metaphors are one way to nudge people to treat acquaintances like family, but usually stronger tactics are needed. In his ethnographic survey, Alan Fisk showed that the ethos of communal sharing, one of his four universal social relations, arises spontaneously among the members of a family, but is extended to other groups only with the help of elaborate customs and ideologies. Unrelated people who want to share like a family may create mythologies about a common flesh and blood, a shared ancestry, and a mystical bond to a territory, tellingly called a natal land, fatherland, motherland, or mother country. They reinforce the myths with sacramental meals, blood sacrifices, and repetitive rituals, which submerge the self into the group and create an impression of a single organism rather than a federation of individuals. Their religions speak of possession by spirits and other kinds of mind melds, which, according to Fisk, suggest that people may often want to have more intense or pure communal sharing relationships than they are able to realize with ordinary human beings. The dark side of this cohesion is groupthink, a cult mentality, 
and myths of racial purity, the sense that outsiders are contaminants who pollute the sanctity of the group. None of this means that non-relatives are ruthlessly competitive toward one another, only that they are not as spontaneously cooperative as kin. End quote. At a later point, he goes on to say, quote, Humans, like ants, could have a gung-ho superorganism thing that prompts them to do everything for the colony. The idea that people are instinctively communal is an important precept of the romantic doctrine of the noble savage. It figured in the theory of Engels and Marx that primitive communism was the first social system. In the anarchism of Peter Kropotkin, who wrote, the ants and termites have renounced the Hobbesian war, and they are the better for it. In the family of man, utopianism of the 1960s, and in the writings of contemporary radical scientists such as Lewontin and Chomsky. Some radical scientists imagine that the only alternative is an Anne Randian individualism in which every man is an island. Stephen Rose and the sociologist Hilary Rose, for instance, call evolutionary psychology a right-wing libertarian attack on collectivity. But the accusation is factually incorrect. As we shall see in the chapter on politics, many evolutionary psychologists are on the political left, and it is conceptually incorrect. The real alternative to romantic collectivism is not right-wing libertarianism, but a recognition that social generosity comes from a complex suite of thoughts and emotions rooted in the logic of reciprocity. That gives it a very different psychology from the communal sharing practiced by social insects, human families, and cults that try to pretend they are families. Trivers built on arguments by Williams and Hamilton that pure, public-minded altruism a desire to benefit the group or species at the expense of the self, is unlikely to evolve among non-relatives because it is vulnerable to invasion by cheaters who prosper by enjoying the good deeds of others without contributing in turn. But as I mentioned, Trivers also showed that a measured reciprocal altruism can evolve. Reciprocators who help others who have helped them and who shun or punish others who have failed to help them will enjoy the benefits of gains in trade and outcompete individualists, cheaters, and pure altruists. Humans are well equipped for the demands of reciprocal altruism. They remember each other as individuals, perhaps with the help of dedicated regions of the brain, and have an eagle eye and a flypaper memory for cheaters. They feel moralistic emotions, liking, sympathy, gratitude, guilt, shame, and anger that are uncanny implementations of the strategies for reciprocal altruition in computer simulations and mathematical models. Experiments have confirmed the prediction that people are most inclined to help a stranger when they can do so at low cost, when the stranger is in need, and when the stranger is in a position to reciprocate. They like people who grant them favors, grant favors to those they like, feel guilty when they have withheld a possible favor, and punish those who withhold favors from them. An ethos of reciprocity can pilot not just one-on-one -on -one exchanges, but contributions to the public good, such as hunting animals that are too large for the hunter to eat himself, building a lighthouse that keeps everyone's ships off the rocks, or banding together to invade neighborhoods or to repel their invasions. The inherent problem with public goods is captured in Aesop's fable, Who Will Bell the Cat? The mice in a household agree they would be better off if the cat had a bell around its neck to warn them of its approach, but no mouse will risk life and limb to attach the bell. A willingness to bell the cat, that is, to contribute to the public good, can nonetheless evolve if it is accompanied by a willingness to reward those who shoulder the burden or to punish the cheaters who shirk it. End quote. So yeah, I really enjoy that last section when it talks about altruism and it kind of identifies two types of altruism, nepotistic altruism and reciprocal altruism, and both have genetic advantages to them, and that is the source of where we gain our 
altruistic inclination. I think it's important to remember that within the framework of a naturalistic evolutionary psychology based examination of the of human nature it's important to recognize that you know we can gain things like altruism and compassion as tools in our in our objective which is survival right the group adv- the, the, the genes that are reciprocally inclined and the group of people who is reciproca- reciprocally inclined toward its other members, those genetics are going to thrive and advance and those traits get passed down. I think as we begin to explore human nature... It's good to have that understanding that there are going to be there are going to be individually selfish actions, there are going to be group based selfish actions, but all actions are going to have on a genetic level that selfish gene um, universal motivation. Ultimate an ultimate motivation to replicate a genetic code. So I think that's going to lead me to wrap up this session. I had some great readings, I think, there from Steven Pinker. Um, I'm really enjoying how we're starting to get onto some of the particulars of human nature uh, that kind of provides a bit of a connection between a knowledge of human nature and exploration of human nature and conservatism and traditionalism um, and the idea that traditionalism carries the cultural framework of our human nature. Uh, it the, the cultural framework is built by a, a re, a repeated applications of human nature, um, and I think that that's kind of the theme that we're going to be going with is how we can tie uh, the scientific study of human nature, the acknowledgement of human nature, and and a conservative political inclination uh, to find that one supports the other and vice versa. So if you like the show, if you like the readings, if you like the books, if you like the direction, if you want to keep me going, help me out by becoming a patron. Um, Patreon.com slash NeoFusionist should bring you there. Uh, The link is in the show notes. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at NeoFusionist. Support the show. Um, get involved in the social networks, share it. If you like it, share it, help me out. Um, I think that I've got some good ideas and I'm hoping to get some feedback and maybe some ideas on new books that are going to help us in this conservative exploration of human nature. Um, I won't take up any more of your time today and that will close us out for this episode. Thanks a lot for tuning in. See you next time.